Okay, so um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk today and thank you for the lovely introduction, Louise. So um, as she's mentioned, I am a rheumatologist and I'm currently undertaking my PhD through the University of Melbourne. Um, and my, the focus of my PhD is actually gastrointestinal involvement in scleroderma. Um, so it fits really nicely with your earlier discussions and we will talk a little bit about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as well to answer any of those questions. So part of the reason we're so passionate about gastrointestinal involvement in scleroderma is because we really know very little about how the gastrointestinal tract is involved in scleroderma, but it's extremely common. Um, and as many of you will attest to, it's associated with significant burden, both in terms of quality of life um, as well as survival. So the talk, my talk today initially um, will center around some of the work that we've done looking at Australian scleroderma patients through the Australian Scleroderma Interest Group. Um, and then it will focus more on common gastrointestinal tract manifestations that you might encounter in scleroderma and that many of you have no doubt have encountered. Um, so we'll focus on um, simple things, lifestyle measures that you can do to manage these uh, complaints as well as then um, adding in a little bit about certain investigations and medications as the next step if needed. So before we start all that, just a, a brief background into gastrointestinal involvement in scleroderma. So as mentioned, it's extremely common and it's in fact the most common um, system involved in scleroderma aside from the skin. So it affects up to 95% of scleroderma patients in many studies and any area of the gut can be involved from the mouth to the anus. Um, the gastrointestinal involvement ranges from the very common symptoms that we'll be discussing later, such as reflux, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, to more serious life-threatening complications, such as malabsorption and pseudoobstruction. So there's a lot that we still don't know about gastrointestinal disease in scleroderma, but what we do know is that the main problems arise from gastrointestinal dysmotility, which essentially means that your gut doesn't move along as well as it should. Um, so normally muscles in the gut contract in a coordinated fashion to move food along, but unfortunately this process often becomes destructive in scleroderma. And so that leads, depending on which area of the gut is most affected, that leads to symptoms like bloating, regurgitating food, reflux, diarrhea, and constipation. Um, unfortunately as well, the medications that we use to treat your skin disease, like um, mycophenolate, methotrexate, even uh, Actemra, don't actually prevent or treat gut symptoms. Um, so it's really important that we get more information on these to better figure out how to treat them. So, Lastly, we know that gastrointestinal complications significantly impact everyone's quality of life, physical function and mood. Uh, but most of these studies were done internationally and we didn't have very much data from Australian patients. So the first part of my talk will centre around the prevalence and impact of gut symptoms in Australian scleroderma patients. So we undertook this study using data from the Australian Scleroderma Cohort Study, which I'm sure many of you are a part of, and thank you very much for your continued involvement because these studies would not be possible without you. Um, so as you know, for those of you who are involved, uh, we run the Australian Scleroderma Cohort Study through numerous hospitals around Victoria, most, most particularly um, Royal Melbourne, Monash and St Vincent's Hospital. And uh, patients who are involved not only get yearly screening with echo and lung function tests, they also undertake a number of questionnaires. And so the questionnaire that we used in this study was the UCLA questionnaire, which um, comprises a number of different domains looking at both symptoms and how they affect your quality of life. Uh, this is a questionnaire that was actually specifically developed to measure gut symptoms in scleroderma um, and it's been validated across many languages and is used in many, many countries. So we used data from 907 scleroderma patients in our study and we looked at comparing people's gut scores with other measures of quality of life and physical function. And then we adjusted for other things that might confound these results. So any other reason you might have a uh, decreased quality of life, such as pulmonary arterial hypertension, age, interstitial lung disease, et cetera. 
So our results showed that gastrointestinal symptoms were really common and about 50% of people reported at least moderate symptoms of either reflux, distension, diarrhea, constipation or a combination thereof. Additionally, 40% uh, of patients reported that their gastrointestinal symptoms at least moderately impacted on their social functioning, like their ability to visit friends or relatives, and nearly 50% of participants felt their gut symptoms negatively impacted their emotional well-being, so increased feelings of depression and anxiety. We found that reflux and distension in particular, so distension is um, bloating in this survey essentially, um, were the most significantly correlated, so, the, so affected uh, poor physical function, quality of life, mental health and fatigue. And that's a, a taking into account other um, factors that could influence that. When we looked at employment, it, we found that people with very severe um, gastrointestinal symptom scores were much less likely to be employed than those who had mild scores. So as you can see, only a quarter of the patients with severe scores were employed, either full or part-time, compared to nearly 50% of people with mild scores. Uh, when we looked at which symptom might be the most responsible for that, we found that diarrhea was the one that had the most significant impact on whether or not you would be employed. And then finally, we looked at the effect of gastrointestinal symptoms on mortality. And these graphs are a bit confusing, but essentially you can see that there's very little difference between all three lines, which means that despite the effect that the gut symptoms clearly had on quality of life, the severity of the gut scores didn't impact survival in our patient cohort. So as you can see here, we concluded that reflux and distension had the most significant impact on physical function, mental health and fatigue. We correlated diarrhea with a lack of employment, um, but we didn't find any association with mortality. So the next study we looked at looked at gastrointestinal involvement, specifically focusing on reflux, which is in fact the most common uh, symptom that most scleroderma patients complain of. Um, so our previous study, as you just heard, not only found that reflux symptoms were very common, but they were associated with worse physical function, mood and fatigue. Um, and additionally, there are some studies in the literature that feel that there may be a correlation between interstitial lung disease and reflux. Um, however, the results are conflicting at the moment. So we sought to look at our scleroderma patients um, and to see if the treatment of reflux improved uh, outcomes and survival, especially in those patients with interstitial lung disease. So again, we used data from the Australian Scleroderma Cohort Study. Um, we defined reflux as reported symptoms or treatment of reflux. Um, and we looked at the association between reflux and demographic and disease characteristics, as well as interstitial lung disease, and then the effect of treatment of reflux. We found, unsurprisingly, that reflux was really common in Australian patients, affecting nearly 94%. Um, it was associated with uh, a number of different scleroderma disease features, as you can see there, but interestingly was not associated with disease subtype, antibody status or gender. When looking at the treatment of reflux with either a proton pump inhibitor or a histamine 2 receptor antagonist, which we will cover in the next uh, stage of this talk, um, we found that treatment was associated with much better survival in all our scleroderma patients. Additionally, when we looked at interstitial lung disease, we found that reflux was not associated with um, increased likelihood of development of interstitial lung disease, worse ILD, or um, a, a time to development of interstitial lung disease. Um, however, as you can see from the graph here, there's a nice separation between the three lines. So we found that not only did um, treatment of reflux with either a proton pump inhibitor or PPI or a histamine 2 receptor antagonist improve survival in those with interstitial lung disease. We found that more aggressive therapy with both of these agents um, improved survival to a greater degree than with single agent therapy only. So this study showed that reflux, um, treating reflux, sorry, Im improved survival in all of our scleroderma patients. And so that takes us to our next part of our talk, which is learning about the common gastrointestinal symptoms in scleroderma 
um, and how they should be initially managed, investigated and treated. So I should mention that this, these recommendations come from a review article which was written with myself, um, Professor Mandy Nikpour and a number of scleroderma experts internationally which will be published in May, I believe, of this year. So the first symptom we're going to discuss is um, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. Um, so dysphagia is quite common in scleroderma. It, the, the symptoms that you normally encounter are difficulty swallowing both solids and liquids. You can get some central chest pain if food feels like it's getting stuck in the esophagus. And occasionally you can also get regurgitation of food back into your mouth after eating or vomiting. Uh, there's a number of different potential causes for difficulty swallowing. The most prominent one is esophageal dysmotility. So your, um, your esophagus isn't contracting as well as it should, which means that food comes back up or gets stuck halfway down. Um, as you can see here, it's really common. And in fact, up to 85% of patients that have only newly been diagnosed with scleroderma and may not have any symptoms yet have evidence of esophageal dysmotility on different studies that we do. Um, additionally, this isn't as much of a problem now, but in previous years where we didn't treat reflux, many patients um, then subsequently got strictures from exposed acid in the esophagus, uh, which then resulted in difficulty um, swallowing. And so there's a number of different things that you can do if you experience any of these symptoms to help to control them. So the first is to take very small bites of food and to cut and chew your food really well. Um, avoiding fibrous foods um, and very dry foods as well can often help. Um, and then if foods are very dry, using different liquids um, like water, sauces or gravies to kind of moisten the food and to help ease its passage down your esophagus can sometimes help. Um, using gravity to your advantage by maintaining an upright posture after meals, so don't lie down. Um, and if you eat um, prior to going to bed, then make sure that you elevate the head of the bed just to help the food kind of find its way down. Well, we would recommend trialing lifestyle measures before any investigations in scleroderma. It's important that you mention to your doctor if you're having any of the symptoms that we mention here, because that might prompt us to um, send you for a gastroscopy much quicker than we usually would. Um, so if you're experiencing any weight loss, if your symptoms get rapidly worse over a very short period of time, or if you're only really having difficulty swallowing solids, feeling so the feeling that solids are getting stuck but liquids pass through really easily, um, then mention this to your doctor because gastroscopy can be used to look for any other causes like strictures that might be causing your difficulty swallowing and um, to help rule out any other causes. So if lifestyle measures didn't improve your symptoms and we and gastroscopy didn't really show anything, there are a couple of other investigations that we can do, but they're pretty invasive and they're not very pleasant to have done. And also they don't always change our management. So these, um, so for example, high resolution manometry, which you see here, um, is mostly just used for research purposes at this time off a very complicated um, difficulty swallowing, but it's certainly not a first line investigation. So it involves inserting a catheter, which is similar to an NG tube, if you, any of you have ever had those inserted, which goes from the back of your throat down to your stomach. And then they've got little pressure sensors along the catheter, which help to measure basically how well your um, uh, esophagus is contracting and how coordinated the fashion is. Um, Additionally, CT chest, if you've had this done for other reasons, such as looking for interstitial lung disease. Um, if we find changes in the esophagus on CT chest, like uh, widening of the esophagus, or sometimes we actually see food still in there, that's usually a really good indication that there might be some um, difficulties with your esophageal motility. So look, what else can you do if you've tried lifestyle measures and they haven't worked and we're certain that your symptoms are coming from uh, poor coordination of your um, esophageal muscles? Um, there are some different medications that we can use, such as promotility agents, and many of you might have been on things like domperidone or metoclopramide before. 
Um, these do have a number of side effects and especially some of them have some cardiac side effects. So for any of you who've listened to Laura Ross's talks on um, how common cardiac involvement is in scleroderma, we're always really cautious using these kind of medications. Additionally, while they may help early on in the disease, um, once your disease has progressed, um, they don't actually have any significant benefit. Um, so if you, it's important to discuss these with your doctor, but absolutely would not recommend them um, for everyone. So the next most common symptom that we often see is reflux, which we've already spoken a little bit about. Um, so the symptoms of reflux that you might encounter are things like heartburn, acid reflux, so the feeling of acid either coming back up into your mouth after you've eaten or a burning in your esophagus. Um, additionally, some people wake up with a metallic taste in their mouth, which can be indicative of untreated reflux. So initially, the lifestyle recommendations that we usually provide for reflux, are, as you can see, very similar to those um, that we recommend for dysphagia. And that's because there's uh, a similarity in the mechanisms that cause it. So again, eating small meals, um, avoid eating two to three hours before bed to help your body digest the food and allow its passage through the stomach um, before you lie down. And if you do go to bed um, uh, within two hours, then keeping the head of the bed upright as much as you can, can help. Um, avoiding triggering foods, which are unfortunately things that most people love, like coffee and wine and chocolate. If you find these foods worsen your reflux or spicy foods, then um, just monitoring them and uh, ju judging your level of tolerance as to whether or not they worsen your reflux is really worthwhile. Another trick is postprandial diaphragmatic breathing or deep belly breathing. So after eating, um, what you can do is just take some really deep breaths. And when you breathe, focusing on, focus on uh, pushing your stomach out. So um, breathing right down into the bottom of your lungs so much that your stomach pushes out. So three to five really deep breaths after eating can often help to trigger um, a parasympathetic response and to help uh, relax and ease digestion. So that's been shown in some studies to help patients, uh, not necessarily scleroderma patients, but patients in general. So treatment of reflux, particularly with medications, is really important. Um, as we discussed earlier, it can actually improve survival. Um, so the most common treatment medications that we give for reflux are things like proton pump inhibitors. So trade names such as Nexium, Somac, Losec, um, or uh, the, the generic names like Pantoprazole, Esomeprazole, um, all of these medications are really useful and really effective for treating acid reflux. So we recommend taking, it's, sorry, it's really important how you take these medications because if you take them the wrong way, then they won't have as much of an effect on your reflux. So it's really important to take them on an empty stomach at least 30 minutes before food. Um, or if you take them right before you go to bed, make sure you've allowed again two to three hours for your stomach to clear before you take them. Um, so I like to think that these medications work by coating the lining of your stomach. And so if you've already got food in there, then they're not going to be able to coat it as well as they can if it's empty. These medications need to be taken regularly and daily. So they're not useful just for when the symptoms occur. It's not like Mylanta where you just take it if you experience reflux. For these treatments to have the most effect, they actually need to be taken daily. Um, most people are on at least daily for these medications, um, but often in scleroderma, we do need to go up to um, taking these medications twice a day um, as it's not always sufficient to control reflux. And finally, there's additional medications like histamine 2 receptor antagonists or Zantac, which we might add in if your reflux is uncontrolled on the proton pump inhibitors alone. 
So it's really important that to know that we don't actually always recommend investigations for symptoms of reflux. And actually most of the gastroenterology colleges um, would say to treat prior to any investigation. So um, it's really normal for you, if you describe reflux symptoms to your doctor for them to immediately put you uh, on a proton pump inhibitor as a trial. We, we use gastroscopies occasionally to confirm the diagnosis of reflux if we're uncertain or to look for any other causes if the treatments aren't working. Additionally, um, we discussed manometry in the previous uh, symptom dysphagia and we can use this again with pH testing, um, which again is pretty invasive, not very comfortable and involves leaving um, uh, like an NG tube in your uh, downer esophagus for about 24 hours and so it's it can be used in really difficult to treat reflux but it's mostly used in uh, studies so there's been a lot of talk about probiotics and whether or not they may actually be useful for treating reflux symptoms um, and the results in scleroderma are mixed so there's been two studies with a total of 80, oh, about 80 patients, and they looked at um, probiotics which contain strains of bifidobacterium or lactobacillus. Um, essentially, um, there was the important takeaways were that they helped some people, but you got better results if you took them for longer. Um, so over three months was used in some studies, um, and then. Also, there was minimal side effects. So some people found they had an increase in diarrhea, but most didn't describe any kind of side effects from probiotics. So if you wanted to try them to help manage your reflux, they would essentially be quite safe. Another common symptom which scleroderma patients experience is that of bloating. So bloating is quite, is affects a number of scleroderma patients. Um, but it can be quite tricky to figure out what's causing it because essentially if you have poor contraction of your stomach, if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, which um, was discussed in uh, earlier, if you have a bowel obstruction or if you have food intolerances like lactose and fructose, this can all cause bloating. So symptoms of bloating um, can be quite dramatic with very large abdominal distension. So um, pants not fitting you, whereas they previously would. Some nausea can also be a symptom. And one of the most common symptoms is actually just a lack of appetite, um, particularly in scleroderma patients. So there's a number of lifestyle recommendations that you can use to help to try and figure out the cause of your bloating. So one of the most important ones is to keep a food diary. And like the FODMAP diet, there's a number of different apps that you can use for this to help track it, or you can um, write it all down in your own paper diary. Um, this can help to identify any foods which may trigger bloating in you because it's very individual um, and can help us to kind of tailor dietary managements. One of the most common things that can cause bloating are carbonated beverages like soft drinks. Um, and so avoiding these may be beneficial for most people. Um, again, small frequent meals are useful to prevent bloating um, as opposed to very large meals. Also, um, gastroenterology society recommendations include meals that are low in fat and fiber to help decrease bloating. And avoiding alcohol and smoking can also be worthwhile. Um, it's really important to keep nutrition in mind with bloating, especially if you experience a lack of appetite. Um, and you may need meal replacement drinks to manage your uh, nutritional requirements. So as I mentioned, bloating can be a bit tricky to investigate um, because it can be from a number of different causes. Um, and so if your um, dietary changes aren't helping with your bloating, then there are a number of different investigations we can do. So gastric emptying studies to help us see how your stomach is contracting can be useful. We can also do those gastric emptying studies on a larger scale to look at how everything moves through your whole gastrointestinal system. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is often diagnosed with breath tests, which unfortunately aren't covered by the PBS and aren't often run in hospitals. And so you may need to pursue this privately, but there's now a number of different home breath tests that you can use. Additionally, food intolerances like fructose or lactose can also cause bloating and so 
If you find um, that you uh, want to check for these things, they can also be done by breath tests. So what else can you do for bloating if you've tried all the investigations and dietary management and it's not working? So again, you can use the promotility agents which essentially help your gut to contract, but there's very little data in scleroderma to actually support this use. And as mentioned, there are a number of different cardiac considerations for some of these medications. So I would advise caution when using them if, if you decide to use them. Um, so important to be aware of the side effects. Another very common symptom in uh, scleroderma is diarrhea. So diarrhea affects, it says up to 80%, but often more patients with scleroderma. Um, and it can be either increased frequency of bowel motions, so going to the toilet multiple times a day to open your bowels, or very loose runny stools. Um, if these symptoms are new and have occurred for less than four weeks, it's important to see your doctor for some poo testing because we need to rule out any infectious causes, particularly if you've recently been on antibiotics or have had any recent overseas travel. So there are a number of different lifestyle recommendations that we would give to patients with diarrhea. So one of them is again, keeping a food diary and avoiding triggering foods. Um, so those that are high in fat can also can often cause diarrhea. Um, anything that has fructose or large amounts of artificial sweeteners in it, particularly the polyols like the sorbitol, mannitol, even xylitol, um, essentially work as laxatives in the gut. Um, so be, being careful of the artificial sweeteners that you use is important. Dairy for some people is a triggering food um, and coffee as well can in some pa people um, cause diarrhea or urgency with going to the toilet. And so monitoring your coffee intake and seeing if this affects you is important. The FODMAP diet, which I heard you all discussing earlier is another really useful consideration and so essentially FODMAP foods are foods that are most likely to cause gas in your gastrointestinal tract um, and be poorly absorbed. Um, and so um, there's been one small study in scleroderma involving 30 scleroderma patients which showed um, improved symptoms when on the FODMAP diet, but these patients had proven fructose malabsorption on breath test. And so it's uncertain how um, generalized we can give, how generalized this information is. Um, it is important if you are on a FODMAP diet to really, I would encourage you to see a dietitian. Any very restrictive diets can cause uh, nutritional deficiencies. And so it's really important to have an expert um, helping you to make sure that you're meeting your nutritional requirements. In some, um, increasing fibre intake um, can be useful to help bulk up the stools and slow them down a little bit as they go through your gastrointestinal tract. I would advise in scleroderma being really careful to start very low with any increased fibre and increase it slowly um, as you are often prone to increased bloating um, and other abdominal pain and other side effects. So if you wanted to try like a Metamucil or a um, psyllium husk, then I would really recommend starting very small, monitoring your symptoms and increasing if you feel comfortable. So again, some symptoms, if you're getting diarrhea, some symptoms that are really important to mention to your doctor would be things like unexplained weight loss. If you have any blood or mucus in your bowel motions, or if we find you to be um, iron deficient, um, this would prompt us to consider things like gastroscopy and colonoscopy to rule out other causes like inflammatory bowel diseases or um, bleeding from your stomach, which is seen in scleroderma. The other investigations, as mentioned, may be breath tests for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or if it's relatively acute in onset, um, then a poo test to look for any causes of infection, such as C. difficile. Um, and then we also may do further blood tests just to make sure that you're not getting any complications from the diarrhea, such as malabsorption. <laughs> 
When looking at diarrhea, we would treat the cause if we found it and avoid triggering foods. Um, likewise, if small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is present, we would recommend antibiotics, plus or minus probiotics, which have been shown in some studies to increase the effectiveness of antibiotic regimes in scleroderma, although the numbers are small. Um, so we've discussed small intestinal bacterial overgrowth a little bit uh, now, and it was brought up in the discussion before. So SIBO is becoming increasingly used um, in the vernacular, so you'll hear it a lot. Um, but I guess the question is, what is it? And so the definition of SIBO is an increase in the number of bacteria in the small bowel. So while many areas of your gut are naturally very rich in bacteria and they're supposed to be, such as the colon, um, the small bowel should really have very little to no bacteria present. And so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is essentially when you get bacteria growing in the small intestine where it shouldn't be. Um, and this can cause inflammation as well as interfere with nutrient absorption. And so that's why we worry about it. The most common symptoms that we see is diarrhea, um, bloating, and on a severe um, end of the spectrum, you can get weight loss from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So as mentioned, it's really common in scleroderma and there are some difficulties with testing, um, but we think it affects a about a third of scleroderma patients um, and scleroderma patients are 12 times more likely to get small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in the general population. So it is something to absolutely consider, particularly if you're getting new diarrhea. Um, the predisposing factors are small bowel dysmotility um, and PPI use, which is important for other reasons, um, but can have some side effects. So um, your, the food normally travels through your gastrointestinal tract quite well if the muscles contract normally. However, sometimes it can get stuck in the small intestine, which can ferment and cause bacterial overgrowth. Additionally, there's some thought you might get reflux of bacteria from other parts of the gut into the small intestine. So how do we diagnose small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? So because the breath tests are not usually run in hospitals. Part of that is because of COVID with the new limitations. Um, and part of it is because they're not covered by the PBS. And so the most non-invasive way that we can test is by breath testing. And that's done by either using glucose or lactulose as a substrate. So if you have ever done these breath tests, it's very similar no matter what they're testing for. Um, if you are testing for lactose malabsorption, someone would give you a large drink which contained a lot of lactose in it. If they're testing for fructose malabsorption, they give you a large drink which contains fructose in it. Um, and when we're testing for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we give you either glucose or lactulose. Um, the reason we give either of these two um, substrates is because they're metabolized by the bacteria in the small bowel. So they're digested and absorbed by the bacteria. And then when these um, substances are being digested, they release gas, which is either hydrogen or methane. And then when you blow into the bag regularly, every half hour, we measure how much hydrogen or methane you are essentially breathing out. And that kind of helps us to test for whether or not there is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, although there's a number of limitations to these studies and they're not always very accurate. Additionally, in people with scleroderma where your gut doesn't always contract well, we're not entirely sure how accurate these tests are. So you'll often find that if you complain of symptoms that your rheumatologist or gastroenterologist might think is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you'll often get a course of antibiotics. So um, I, I noticed one person mentioned rifaximin earlier. So rifaximin is probably one of the um, most effective antibiotics for treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth based on studies. So as you can see here, it has a 73% cure rate. And when guar gum was added in one study, which is essentially um, a prebiotic, um, then it had a higher cure rate. The problem with rifaximin is that it's a bit difficult to get in Australia, 
for this indication. So it's covered on the PBS for traveler's diarrhea and for people who have um, liver failure, but it's not actually covered in terms of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So there are certain compounding pharmacies where it's a bit more affordable, but it is often quite expensive to get these medications. Um, so if it is too difficult for your treating doctor to obtain rifaximin for you, then there are, as you can see, a number of different antibiotic regimes below that have a number of, or sorry, have a wide variety of cure rates. It's not uncommon to have to take more than one course of antibiotics to get rid of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, You'll see here there's a bit of information on something called Saccharomyces boulardii, which is actually a yeast um, which you can get in health food stores um, in the probiotic area. Um, and it is um, used in, or it has been used in one study to look at the treatment for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in scleroderma patients, and it had about a 33% cure rate. So constipation is the next symptom that we'll discuss, uh, which is also incredibly common in scleroderma patients. So the literature suggests that it affects up to 50% of scleroderma patients, but in reality, it's probably more. The symptoms that you might experience are um, not opening your bowels very often, so less than three times a week. You might have a, also have a lot of difficulty opening your bowels, so a lot of straining or feeling that even after you've been to the toilet, um, you've still got um, stuff left in your rectum. And so the lifestyle recommendations that we would recommend for constipation, one of them is actually increasing your physical activity as much as you're able. So there's good reviews that show that increasing exercise and physical activity is really helpful for constipation. Um, it's often limited in scleroderma, but just doing what you can, can help to improve your symptoms. Um, making sure that you're drinking enough water, particularly if you've increased your dietary fiber intake is really important. Again, a trial of increased fiber can be useful in constipation, but I would, I would caution you again to start with a very low dose. So whatever the packet says, go half to a quarter of that um, and just very slowly increase it and monitor your symptoms really carefully to see how you're tolerating it. Um, it's also uh, important to have a look at your drugs to see if any of these are causing constipation. So common painkillers like endone and codeine um, are quite uh, detrimental in terms of constipation and can really worsen uh, constipation. So making sure that um, if these medications are certainly necessary in some people, but if you are on them, just making sure that you try and get to the lowest dose possible. Um, and then if you're straining a lot to go to the uh, toilet, then pelvic floor physiotherapy can sometimes be really useful in this circumstance. So the other things that we can do to treat constipation include giving laxatives. So I'm sure many of you will have been on at some stage lactulose, coloxal and senna or glycerin suppositories. Um, these can be useful in treating constipation, particularly if it hasn't responded to the lifestyle measures um, previously mentioned. Um, we don't do too many investigations for constipation. The most important one is to ensure that you're up to date with your bowel screening programs that the government sends you. If it's really severe or if you're not passing any wind um, and you have a lot of bloating, we might do x-rays just to make sure there's no obstruction. Finally, we can do whole gut transit studies, which involves you uh, drinking a solution of contrast and then we get x-rays done at uh, I think 24, 12, 24, 48 and 72 hours. So it's quite a long test but it kind of helps us to see how the um, how your gut is moving along. Again there are a number of other agents that you can try for constipation particularly procalipride which is a new motility agent which doesn't have very much in the way of cardiac side effects has been used to treat constipation in some scleroderma studies um, but I would really recommend speaking to a gastroenterologist or a specialist um, if you were considering these medications because we don't use them too much as rheumatologists. So the final symptom we're going to have a uh, chat about today is fecal incontinence. Um, so 
fecal incontinence based on studies affects up to 38% of scleroderma patients. However, we we think this might be an underestimation as it's often not reported by patients because of um, embarrassment, essentially. Um, the symptoms include um, things like loss of fecal contents um, with or without the feeling the need to go to the toilet. Um, sometimes you can get leakage of stool into your underwear without really knowing or feeling it. Um, and the other more subtle symptoms can be things like itching around your um around your anus and skin irritation and ex and the extreme end you can get infections. So that we don't have too much to treat fecal incontinence at the moment, but one of the things which can help is that if you have very loose watery stools, bulking those up and treating any causes of diarrhea can really improve um, uh, symptoms of fecal incontinence. Additionally, if you have any severe constipation, treating this can help. Um, and if you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, then treatment of that can help as well. There are some investigations we can do for faecal incontinence, um, but they're, off, they're invasive um, and they don't always change our management. So we definitely wouldn't recommend them first line, but if all of your other um, measures are not working uh, then and some other investigations have been negative, then discussing them with your doctor can sometimes be worthwhile. So there's some there's been a couple of studies in scleroderma looking at newer treatments of fecal incontinence. Um, one of this is biofeedback training. So biofeedback training is a program which encompasses education about uh, defecation, anal squeeze exercises um, and rectal sensory retraining. Um, and there's been one study of 13 women with scleroderma which showed some improvement in symptoms and quality of life following a six week program and those benefits were sustained over six months. Um, so while there isn't too much in the way of data, there also wasn't very little side, there was also no side effects from this. Um, and then there have finally been a few studies looking at modulation of the sacral nerves um, to improve the con anal control. Um, again, these studies, very few, very small numbers, and these ones only had a short period of follow-up. So neuromodulation, is a very complicated way of saying we essentially stimulate the sacral nerve um, and this can be done two ways. The first involves direct stimulation so it, it requires um, a device to be implanted during surgery um, and in scleroderma the results of this particular um, treatment are mixed. Um, so there's been two case series which with a total of 15 women which show which again showed mixed results. Um, the other one, which is non-invasive, is called percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. And this essentially involves a nerve stimulation device, which is worn on your ankle. Um, so there was one small trial, again, only 10 to 13 scleroderma patients, where there was a small improvement, um, but there wasn't a very long follow-up. And again, the numbers were quite small. So how this relates to scleroderma patients in general, at the moment, we're not sure. So in summary, it was a bit of a whirlwind tour of gastrointestinal symptoms in scleroderma, um, but the take home messages is that we often treat these symptoms symptomatically um, without investigating unless you have any red flag symptoms. We would always recommend lifestyle modifications as the first line treatment and they're something that you can try at home. Um, the investigations that are involved are invasive and they're not they don't always change our management, um, but if you have any red flag symptoms, that's a different story, so please discuss with your doctor. Um, and additional medications can be considered, but as I mentioned, they have a number of side effects and they're not always helpful. And so discussing them with your local doctor, your rheumatologist or your gastroenterologist in particular, um, is definitely something that I would recommend and I would not under any circumstances recommend uh, everyone in scleroderma should be on these medications. I think it should be very individual um, and discussed carefully before you start them. Okay, so thank you everyone involved. Um, thank you especially to the Australian, the patients of the Australian Scleroderma Interest Group. Without your 
constant participation in all of our surveys and tests. We wouldn't have any of the data that you heard in the first part of the talk. Um, and thank you again to Scleroderma Victoria for the Harrison Penclot Scholarship. Um, so I will head back.